basically, let me just just give a very brief overview of what what the ideas are. Uh, obviously, from the uh, from the title of the paper, what we want to do is say something about the uh, the Great Gatsby curve. In other words, this uh, this politically uh, salient and uh, I think uh, uh, substantively interesting observation that uh, there seems to be a relation that argument that there seems to be some positive relationship between measures of uh, cross-sectional inequality and measures of uh, intergenerational persistence. Uh, the, the argument of the paper essentially is going to be that there are reasons to believe that Gatsby-like behavior are a component of, uh, of the American economic experience. And, uh, and so in that sense, what will distinguish this paper from the conventional discussions of the Gatsby curve, at least some of them, is that our focus is on an intertemporal Gatsby curve. In other words, you look within one country and make an observation that changes in inequality will have particular consequences for, for intergenerational mobility. Uh, in thinking that way, we will emphasize, first of all, the argument that there's a causal relation. I, I actually hate, I, I have a five-year moratorium on the word causal, given the problems in econometrics. There is a mechanism that maps trend <laughs> across sexual inequality to, uh, to mobility, and, uh, and I'll delineate both uh, a, a very stylized theoretical model and, uh, and some facts that hopefully are, are suggestive of that. All right. Now, Really, the, the argument of the paper is, is going to be quite simple in terms of what the, what the mechanism story is going to be, and that is that uh, it's going to take an explicitly social perspective on, uh, on, uh, on the intergenerational transmission process, which is not to say families don't matter, but matter to add, it, add, add, a, add a piece to it. And so the thought experiment in the paper is to think about environments in which there's some set of ways in which we model uh, cross-sectional inequality, and then ask what happens as the tails fatten out, so to speak. And the mechanism is going to be that as in cross-sectional inequality increases, certain types of segregation in the, uh, the economy are enhanced. And so the focus in the, in the, uh, the Twain model is neighborhoods. And there the idea would be no deeper than saying if you spread out the distribution of incomes, one sees enhanced segregation of, uh, of, uh, of neighborhoods by income. And so once you, once you build that into the model, you can see immediately you get Gatsby-like behavior. You increase cross-sectional inequality, the consequence is going to be increased segregation. And once you have increased segregation, one has increased disparities in the factors, the influences on affluent children versus less affluent children. And once you put those together, you have a slowdown of, uh, of the conventional measures of mobility. And so by implication, the Gatsby curve emerges as an equilibrium from this mechanism in which inequality begets segregation, segregation begets immobility. Right. Now, in saying that, um, I want to make a couple of comments. The first is that it's taking ideas in some sense, uh, 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 it's fortuitous that I, this was in the paper before the identity of the uh, discussant was revealed, and that is that the serious point is that you know, Roland in particular pioneered many of these ideas in the 1990s in terms of trying to understand how different types of social influences, social interactions, spillover effects lead to uh, implications for degrees of segregation. And so it's, it's drawing on an older theoretical literature, and, uh, and, and there's a background there. The second comment I want to observe is even though the discussion in the paper will largely focus, certainly in the theory entirely and in the empirics largely on issues of income segregation and in neighborhoods, the general idea is, is broader. In other words, that if we think about many facets of the economy, be it neighborhoods, be it uh, schools, be it colleges, uh, be it firms, changes in inequality will, can, will under plausible theoretical uh, conditions and uh, with associated empirical evidence that's reasonable, enhance segregation and hence become a mechanism by which uh, persistence is enhanced. So in other words, one could tell an analogous story for uh, changes in the degree of the sort of matching of students to colleges, uh, skill levels to firms, et cetera. And so uh, I have in some work called that the membership's theory of inequality. All right. So what the, pa the way that the, uh, the uh, paper proceeds is first there's, there's a toy model that's supposed to, its entire purpose is to sort of give theoretical coherence to, to certain claims. And then uh, three pieces of evidence or three dimensions of evidence are put on the table. The first uh, 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 were very broad empirical facts that are consistent with this vision of increased inequality, increased segregation, decreased mobility. And so that's going to be drawing from different parts of the literature, everything from the work of uh, Chetty Hendren co-authors to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, findings in the sociology literature. That's going to be one set of exercises. I'm going to call those big picture facts consistent with the theory. Uh, I was told I'm not allowed to call them stylized facts by one of the uh, editors. <laughs> but <laughs> the, sec uh, the second, uh, so that's going to be one dimension of empirical evidence. 
The second dimension of empirical evidence will be some, uh, some intergenerational mobility regressions. In other words, looks at uh, models, uh, you know, standard regressions uh, that estimate intergenerational, intergenerational, yeah, can't talk anymore. It really was a long flight. Intergenerational elasticity of income in which uh, certain non-linearities are allowed to occur and certain uh, neighborhood type effects are allowed to occur. And then ask the question one, is there some empirical evidence supportive of the, the mechanisms of the theory he focuses on? And second, what, what are the implied Gatsby curves from those types of, uh, of exercises? And so there, there'll be some evidence, not wonderful evidence, but some evidence of Gatsby-like uh, behavior. Then the final part of the, uh, the empirical uh, pieces is going to be a calibration exercise, which uh, will take a structural model of, uh, of neighborhood effects and human capital formation. It'll be, it'll, it'll be an enriched model in the sense there'll be multiple time periods of, uh, of life, et cetera, and sequential choices by both parents and individuals in human capital formation. And again, go through an exercise asking if you take this environment, calibrate it, uh, in, for some of the parameters, estimate other parameters, and run counterfactuals on inequality, what will be the implications for the Gatsby curve? And the upshot of the empirical work of at least flavors three and four will be we have modest evidence of, of a Gatsby curve. And in other words, uh, to claim that this is going to explain the full uh, a, 50, a, a 0.15 change in intergenerational elasticity would be false, unfortunately. But to say that it explains 15% might be a, a plausible statement. Okay. so. By way of the background of the theory, the way that we want to think about this Gatsby notion is that we have some transmission process from parents to offspring. That's just a stochastic process. And once you have a stochastic process, you can ask questions such as what if you change the variance of one of the inputs of the process, in this case parental income, and see what the consequences are for the associated measures of intergenerational mobility. And so thinking about it this way, obviously the, the standard model in the literature is just a linear model in which you regress offspring income, a parental income and offspring income. And if I thought that the variance or some function of the variance of income is the uh, notion of cross-sectional inequality, and I treated the intergenerational elasticity, the Ig beta, as the measure of persistence, there's no Gatsby curve. <laughs> in other words, the whole point is that this type of exercise tautologically treats, uh, has an object that is invariant with respect to changes in parental income. And so in thinking about the paper and the observation of the Gatsby curve, these are just statements that say that in, I have different ca cases where I see a variance of parental income or some function of the variance. I have measures of the IGE, and I'm getting a relationship between them. And just as a trivial statistical matter, what's going to be happening in the generalized models is that the argument is that the first equation, which generates the mobility measure, is misspecified once one accounts for certain richnesses in the process of uh, the transmission of parental socioeconomic status to offspring. And so a general way to write that is simply to say that the coefficient itself, beta, is not an invariant, but it depends on things. A trivial way to make it depend on things is to say it depends on parental income. In other words, the actual process is a nonlinear process. A different way to think about it is that it, it's either, it could be that it's nonlinear and that there's other variables that are, that, are interme that are intermediaries between the parental income and the offspring income. And obviously the philosophy of the paper, so to speak, is an argument that the social factors help mediate those relationships. And so the upshot is that any, any affirmative argument about the nature of the Gatsby curve, at least from the vantage point of trying to explain why variance of, 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 of parental income is, or, is, or variances of income and mapping into intergenerational mobility is really from the perspective of the underlying statistical analyses, a statement that the conventional way of measuring mobility has a, some misspecification in it, and that's the thing we need to somehow tease out in the analysis. All right, so what I want to say is that the model we're going to present is not, it, it's, uh, it's just derivative from, from, from older stuff, and what it's really going to do is it's going to take the becker tomes model and in certain ways, uh, Make, create a social analog to it. And so what I mean by that is, it, and, and you know, there's a bunch of algebra which leads to very little in terms of <laughs> that stuff is at least surprising. But the way this environment's going to be set up is the following, and that is that you have these adult labor market outcomes that's going to be offspring income that are going to be determined by human capital that's, uh, that, that's accumulated earlier in life, or I can call it skills if we want to be a little bit more au courant, so that's a triviality. The second point is that the human capital accumulation in this model is going to be socially determined. And what I mean by that is that in thinking about the environment, individuals are raised in objects called neighborhoods, which will be equivalent to school districts. And so in this thought experiment, 
it isn't a matter of thinking about independent dynasties, so like a character group, Becker Tomes, in which there's some transmission directly from parents to offspring via a parental investment, but rather the parental incomes are going to determine the neighborhoods that individuals grow up in, or put differently, the schools that they attend. And so the model will have built into it, by assumption, two mechanisms that map the distribution of incomes in a neighborhood to offspring socio uh, educational attainment. One of them will simply be the local, will be local uh, 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 finance of education. Of course, that's an artifice of American political economy, which has been praised uh, at lunch and earlier. And then the second comment will, idea will be they'll be built into it direct social interactions. And so the model itself will be a black box in terms of saying that there's a mapping from the characteristics of the parents of the, uh, within a community and the, and the consequences for children. But there's, of course, associated with that a, a deeper uh, micro, micro literature, micro theoretical literature on the mechanisms. So that's going to be the thought experiment. And so once that's true, there's going to be incentives in the model, the way that the assumption, you know, we think about things uh, either exhibiting complementarities or going to be uh, being increasing in certain arguments for parents to prefer more successful, more affluent neighbors. All right. In other words, I want better, quote unquote, more desirable role models for my children. I want a more affluent parents to tax, so on and so forth. At the same time, there will be incentives by assumption of the model for larger communities. And so the upshot in the model is going to be that the equilibrium degree of segregation is a function of the interplay between incentives for high income neighbors and incentives for many neighbors. And so, and so again, it's kind of rigged, the model's rigged to have that in it. And so one automatically gets the result that as income inequality spreads out, we get increased segregation uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. Once that happens, we get this mapping from inequality to, uh, 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 in, to, to persistence. And so the model itself will have some very stark features to it in the sense that uh, it's going to be built into a growing environment. In other words, incomes are growing across time and we can get, you know, the model at least in principle can generate things such as permanent decoupling of subsets of the population from one another. Those are obviously stylized exaggerations, but the upshot is one, that the model at least formalizes the idea that one can move from an environment in which there's social determin of, uh, determination of skills and education to segregation is the intermediary between parental income and uh, offspring income and hence Gatsby-like behavior. Now, let me just say that this is not a unique way to set the model up. There's in fact two other uh, you know, sets of models that could do exactly the same thing. One of them is due to Casey Mulligan, and so these would be models that are family investment models, and once you build in things like credit constraints, I can automatically get a nonlinear relationship between parental income and offspring income and generate Gatsby behavior off the nonlinearity. The second uh, set of models would be things that uh, 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 Becker, Commoners, uh, Murphy, and Spencock have, Spencock have worked on, and there what they do is they introduce a heterogeneity in the IGE coefficient that has to do with the level of parental human capital. So the idea is the parents that are highly educated, their investments in their children are more, are more productive than, than otherwise. And so there's not a uniqueness, in other words, between taking a, uh, an, an overlapping generations model, building in certain types of mechanisms that deviate from Becker Tomes and mapping that into Gatsby-like equilibrium. All right, it's a very long model. I don't think it's interesting, so I'm gonna skip all of that. And uh, I just wanna give two propositions at the end of the paper. Uh, the two propositions of interest are what I'm calling the decoupling proposition, and that is that in this environment, in which essentially what's going to be happening is you have, uh, you have families all exhibiting positive income growth. It might be small, it may be large, in essence, what can happen in the model is it's positive for permanent inequalities to emerge. And what that means is if you get sufficient inequality at a point in time, there's a positive probability that the incomes of the descendants of the highest income family and the descendants of the lowest income family, they never converge. The trick essentially is that in these growing economies, there's this space for permanent inequalities generationally to emerge that you simply don't have in stationary environments. Stationary environment, almost all the probability is gonna be, be in this nice bounded set. So eventually when you trace the dynasties of, over time, they're gonna crisscross. That's, right. <laughs> that, that's the intuition to the uh, convergence results in stationary environments. Those break down in the growing environments. The second theorem is maybe the lamest theorem ever, at least I've ever written, and that may be saying a lot, and that is that uh, the model can generate an, a, a, uh, an, intergener an intertemporal uh, or intergenerational Great Gatsby curve. And what I mean by that, what we mean by that is that there are 
configurations of parental income such that you spread the income out, you will get monotonically an increase in an estimated intergenerational elasticity of income. Now, the reasons for that are twofold. One, once the IG coefficients are differing across neighborhoods, that means that we no longer, it actually matters what the distributions of the families relative to those IG coefficients. So if I spread things out, I get new answers. That's mechanism one. Mechanism two is the IG coefficients themselves change because it changes in segregation as I spread out the parental incomes. So those two mechanisms can generate the Gatsby curve. However, I want to be clear, that does not logically, that's not logically entailed. And so the point is that the IGE coefficient and something such as the variance of income, those are very radical dimension reductions of the actual high dimensional stochastic process of these family dynasties. And so one can construct particular distributions of incomes of parents where you don't get the Gatsby phenomenon, even though it kind of the model's been rigged to generate the potential for Gatsby via this heterogeneity in the coefficients. And so I just want that on the table that you know, the, the, the theorem is weak because it, the dimension reduction necessary to talk about a Gatsby curve is quite draconian. All right, so that's what I wanted, all I want to say about the, uh, uh, about the, uh, the, th the theory itself. Now, what do I mean by evidence in favor of the proposition? How am I doing on time besides poorly? Five minutes. I'm sure, you 15 minutes, thank you. Okay, so there's three propositions I want to put on the table in terms of the evidence. The first proposition is there actually is some evidence of, an of, a, of, a, of, a, of a Gatsby curve. And what I mean by that is if you look by the you know, temporal Gatsby curve. And so if you take work, for example, with Bash Mazumdar, uh, what he and, co and, and Daniel Aronson and other co-authors have been able to do is establish things such as that there's some relationship between the 90-10 wage ratio and changes in uh, measures of persistence across time. And so what the paper does is it uh, basically reproduces some of the thought experiments in the Mazumdar type work, all of which are direct suggestions of, of a Gatsby curve. And so I, uh, I'm just going to skip those very quickly. Uh, the second thing I want to say, I seem to have done a really poor job of putting these slides together. Uh, the, uh, the, se the second thing, yeah, this is really, uh, I'm glad my co-author's not here because he would really mock me. All right, the second, comment I want to, the second comment, which I actually omitted from the slides, and I apologize, is that there is a nexus between location, mobility, and inequality, and that was really just the statement of the, what the Chetty, famous Chetty diagram tells us, which is that if you look across the United States, there's something spatial about changes in, in, uh, in mobility. So uh, that's the second stylized fact. The third one is that income segregation is pervasive and growing. So in other words, what Chetty and all do is they say there's something about space. The one I want to say is something about segregation. And so examples of that would be the spatial distribution of poverty rates, Another example would be what I'm going to call the fractal nature of income segregation, to steal a line from a famous New York Times columnist. And that is, when you look at an individual city, for example, such as Chicago, you see this hyper-segregation by income. So in other words, these different levels, there's very substantial segregation. What is of particular interest for this paper is work by uh, uh, Sean Reardon at Stanford, who has looked at the dynamics of income segregation across neighborhoods and finds, interestingly, that income segregation is increasing in the United States uh, over the last several decades, even though racial segregation is decreasing. And so the argument that these income type mechanisms are important and are via uh, contemporary inequality growing is, 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 is something that comes out of the rear of the work. All right, now I could push this harder and make observations when we look at census, the, the census tract income uh, measures over time. Once again, we see this uh, increase in, uh, in the variance across neighborhoods. And we see similar things at the state level. Fourth thing I want to say is that there is spatial heterogeneity associated with the factors that matter for human capital formation, for skills formation. So if you think about the picture I have in my head is I have income that's creating segregation of neighborhoods, but the issue is what the consequences of that are for actual skill formation, human capital formation. And here there's just two things I want to put on the table. One of them is, as you well known by everybody in this room, very substantial spatial variation in per capita public school expenditure across school districts. I will add parenthetically, this does not adjust for what the money's spent on. And so there's a literature, of course, on whether or not money matters. And the, I think the upshot of the literature is very simple. It matters. You spend it on stuff that's relevant for education. And so leaving it, so, the, uh, this, so this is at least prima facie evidence of the mechanisms we talk about. Uh, you say the similar thing again when I call the fractal structure. You look within a, a notoriously egalitarian state. And even there, you see very high levels of differences in per pupil expenditure. Final comment I wanted to make was that if you think about social interactions and the role of segregation, 
One of the examples of social influences which, where the evidence is extremely robust is the adverse effects, this won't come as a shock, of exposure to violence on learning. And so enormous heterogeneity and exposure to violent crime, the distribution of murder rates in Chicago is uh, you know, just simply a simple example of that. So upshot of that is if you sort of think about the pieces that went into the theoretical model in a very big picture sense, I, I, I'm able, I can, one can pull out evidence that these phenomena are, 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 exist. Second thing we do in the paper, as I said, was we run sets of IgE regressions. And the way that, to think about these, these experiments is we first think about some non-parametric models. Then we think about um, some, uh, some, let me, uh, some parametric models. The distinction is that the non-parametric model doesn't say is non-linearity the source of the Gatsby group, nothing new to say. The parametric models are introducing in a structured way, obviously with loss of generality, neighborhood, as in census tract, and state measures of, of, uh, the district of characters of income, first and second moments, and asking to these tell us something about the IG process. Okay, sorry, how about, I'm, I'm just gonna take two minutes. All right, okay, I'm just gonna skip, skip uh, everything just to say, the only question you might want to ask is, can these things generate the Gatsby? Yes, I, okay, we present tables and evidence. These neighborhood effects matter, state effects matter, so on and so forth, state income matters. What one can then do is actually take these equations and by implication ask what, 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 are the, what is the Gatsby curve that the stochastic process that we estimated look like? And so if you look at the nonlinearities in the IG process, uh, we get the opposite of a Gatsby curve. In other words, the Gatsby curve is supposed to be upward sloping. That's a positive relationship. It turns out the non-parametric uh, estimates themselves would not give us that phenomenon. In contrast, if you looked at the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the census tract behavior, we get mild, or you should say gentle Gatsby curves. In other words, if you look at the particular nonlinearities, not in the non-parametric family sense, but the nonlinearities as built in by dependence of the transmission process on the census tract characteristics, we get the phenomena that we were looking for. All right. so. When we go through a set of exercises of that type. As I said, I think of that as gentle evidence. No, not gentle. It's reasonable evidence. It's not some smoking gun, but uh, the gun is not, is not stone cold. The final thing we do is go through a fairly uh, elaborate calibration exercise, of which I will just show you one result. As I guess you know, I, 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 I'm a graduate of the James Heckman School of Slides. All right. <laughs> All right. So, okay, the only, the only point is the following, and that is you take this calibrated model, you go through a, uh, you know, the, the full analysis of the model, and at the end you can ask questions such as what happens if you were to expand the variance of parental income? And the answer is that as you go across uh, different levels of parental income, you start with the baseline variance, you increase the standard deviation by 10% and 20%. We get, we get about a 2% a change in IG. In other words, it goes from 0.35 to 0.37. That sounds very modest, but remember, you gotta metrize things correctly, and that is all of the action on the big change in mobility is 0.15. So we get, we're getting something about a 10%, or 10 to 15% of what is the object that's been interested, of interest in terms of decreased mobility. So upshot is, uh, I think that there's plot, we tried to identify plausible theoretical conditions for a Gatsby curve. I think that we were able to provide some modest, uh, I said moderate, maybe modest is a better word, evidence of that. And then what we do in the conclusion, which I will skip, is, is give some policy uh, speculation. So let me leave it at that, thank you.